the mayor of Kyiv has declared a 35-hour curfew after a series of Russian missile strikes hit residential areas of Ukraine's capital. At least two people died when a Russian missile hit a 16-story apartment complex. This comes as the prime ministers of the Czech Republic, Poland and Slovenia travel to Kyiv to meet with the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky. Talks are also resuming today between Ukraine and Russia. On Monday, U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for an immediate end to the war. Ukraine is on fire. The country is being decimated before the eyes of the world. The impact on civilians is reaching terrifying proportions. Countless innocent people, including women and children, have been killed. After being hit by Russian forces, roads, airports and schools lie in ruins. According to the World Health Organization, at least 24 health facilities have suffered attacks. Hundreds of thousands of people are without water or electricity. And with each passing hour, two things are increasingly clear. First, it kept getting worse. Second, whatever the outcome, this war will have no winners, only losers. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres, we go now to Ukraine, where we're joined by Peter Zalmayev, the director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative, joining us from outside of Kyiv. Peter, welcome to Democracy Now! You have you. this you. emergency curfew that has just been imposed. What is it, 35, 36 hours? Can you describe what you're experiencing right now in your community? Well, the, the curfew being imposed by the mayor is definitely is clearly uh, designed to prevent uh, from any uh, provocations inside. Um, you know, we now have information that you know, weeks prior to the invasion, uh, Russians have sent uh, their diversionary groups, um, you know, so these clandestine cells uh, to infiltrate the Ukrainian cities, particularly Kiev. Uh, there have been uh, a few dozen identified during the first, you know, phase. Uh, of the war when there was an attack on Kiev, an attempt to take Kiev by force. Um, uh, several of these, uh, numbering the hundreds, uh, were neutralized, by which I mean uh, destroyed. Uh, but the fear is that there's still a lot of them there, and they will try to, uh, you know, uh, to attack from the inside. And so uh, Kiev is living relatively, uh, you know, considering that we have two three rocket attacks per day now. It's already getting normalized. The idea that the capital of Ukraine is getting rocket attacks and a, a few people die every day, it's still not on the scale, thank God, of Mariupol, where there are thousands reported dead. Um, so overall, I would say that the situation is, you know, there's no panic necessarily. Uh, the steady flow of evacuees, you know, is proceeding. Uh, but about a, a half of the pre-war population of Kiev remains, which is about 2 million people. Peter, you were predicting that Putin would invade in early February, when most people were saying he, he, he wouldn't dare do this at this extensive level of the whole country. Um, why did you think this? And uh, talk about what exactly this means for the population of Ukraine. Of course, he expected, like Rumsfeld did when the U.S. invaded Iraq, to be met with flowers and applause. To say the least, um, this not only has happened, but it has brought together Together, perhaps a very fractured society. Well, indeed, you know, this um, Vladimir Putin's miscalculation uh, is pretty glaring. You know, he try he constantly is trying to poke America in the eyes with what he claims is its hypocrisy, such as going to Iraq under false pretenses in 2003, and then uh, building unrealistic expectations, like you said, about how they would be greeted, such as greeted by his liberators. Well, Putin is, uh, you know, whatever he claims about the U.S., you know, misadventures in the Middle East, he's repeating, he seems to be repeating repeating the same mistakes. You know, he miscalculated the strength of the resistance, the morass that he would sink uh, into, and the willingness uh, 
of Ukrainians to greet uh, Russians as liberators. That has not panned out uh, like that. So when I was saying in February that uh, the the invasion was, was coming, it was obviously clear that for Vladimir Putin to back down after having amassed 200,000 troops uh, on the borders of Ukraine uh, would have been a political suicide. Just as much as it is for him now to sort of roll back his troops is tantamount to you know, political and also physical suicide, almost, I would say. Uh, that's why you hear this talk about the need to find an off-ramp for Vladimir Putin so he can announce victory. That's a separate, uh, you know, uh, subject for conversation, whether that should be happening. Um, you know, uh, when you talk about the—if you ask me about Ukrainian society, what it has done to the Ukrainian society, uh, well, first of all, almost three million people have fled Ukraine. But just judging from what I'm seeing driving around, I've driven hundreds of miles around Ukraine in the last two, two or three weeks. Uh, I have not seen that level of national— uh, consciousness um, uh, ever in my life. I mean, the only uh, pre precedent for that would be the the war of the World War Two in 1940s. I mean, this is uh, as black and white an issue for Ukrainians as it's ever been. No shades of gray here. It's as a war for liberation. It's a war for freedom. I mean, normal in peaceful times, I would sort of shy away from these terms. It's too lofty, maybe almost cheesy, you know, if you allow me. But I mean, these are the terms in which we think uh, we, we think right now. We uh, look at the invading hordes. We, we call them orcs, sort of like in the Tolkien language. Uh, we call Russia Mordor. Uh, it's actually now accepted. I mean, you hear it from Russia, from Ukrainian TV presenters. This is sort of the semi-official way to describe what we're seeing and uh, the barbarity to which uh, Vladimir Putin's troops have resorted in bombing our city centers, uh, our infrastructure. The damage is estimated uh, upwards of $100 billion already. Um, it is all clear that uh, there's they're not having any uh, military successes, so they're just really, they're just bent on Revenge and, uh, and, and 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 anger that they're venting on civilians. Peter Zamayev, you actually are from Donetsk. <laughs> Can you talk about what's happening there? It's you know it was kind of qu quiet for a while because simply because of the the the, the front line there. Uh, having existed in place since 2014, was the most fortified. That's why you see this in, uh, incredible battle uh, for Mariupol. I mean, there, there's, uh, I, I wouldn't be at liberty to uh, venture, I guess, how many fighters are still there, but the invading force that has encircled Mariupol is infinitely uh, uh, bigger. And yet, uh, they're not having, I mean, they're killing civilians, but they're not uh, achieving their their goal. They have yet to take a major population center anywhere in Ukraine, with the exception of Kherson, which every day you have sporadic pro-Ukrainian rallies there, and they can't put them down. So coming back to Donetsk, it was relatively quiet, and then the, the quiet was shattered uh, yesterday when uh, a rocket apparently was uh, blown, out, blown off the skies and landed in a uh, right smack in the center of the city next to one of my apartments, I own several apartments which have been sitting empty there this whole time. Uh, and one of them blew out all the windows in the apartment. My The, the, the person who's been uh, watching over the, the apartment just called me and told me that, you know, it's looking pretty bad. It was l large devastation. And as many we hearing, as many as 20 people were killed. We're not sure which rocket it was. A true fog of war situation. Uh, and so uh, here you go. We're hearing numbers as high as 20,000 dead in Mariupol, in the south. Is that possible? Uh, yes, I, I heard this as well. Mm, I would doubt that figure. Uh, we're talking definitely several thousand. The last I heard was two to 3,000, 20,000. Maybe an exaggeration, uh, even though, you know, that's shaky ground, you know, trying to you know, question the figures by people who are there. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't believe it's 20,000, but we're definitely talking 3,000 or so. And if that is the case, and if the situation, if if the trends sort of, uh, you know, continues the same way, um, we are going to see uh, the worst kind of, you know, worst case scenario that was um, 
actually mentioned by a German tabloid Bild right before the war, which actually, I'll, I'll be honest with you, outraged me. I could not believe that this was be this would be our reality, but actually, it's you know it predicted as many as fifty thousand civilian deaths. So far, I can't tell you the you know we're talking maybe up up to five thousand civilian death in the country, but considering that Vladimir Putin has not shown any decrease in appetite uh, in bombing us. Uh, I mean, you know, just God knows how, how much more casualties we will suffer. Peter Zamayev, you mentioned the off-ramp for Putin. What do you see that could be, and what would be acceptable to the people of Ukraine? Well, an off-ramp, obviously, he's seeking, at least on paper, he's seeking for uh, uh, seeking uh, that Ukraine declare a, new, a, a neutral status, uh, a sort of Finlandization that's sort of been bandied about this term, uh, and, and a, an official uh, um, decision to stop pursuing NATO membership. Uh, I think those are very doable. Uh, I do not believe they're really what uh, have been uh, motivating Vladimir Putin in, in, in Ukraine. I think it's a very old school 19th century war of subjugation, war of land conquest that we're seeing from Vladimir Putin, the guy who does not use internet and is very much mired in his old kind of uh, old school thinking of military glory and conquest. Uh, but at least on paper, their official you know uh, displeasure has been NATO expansion, as you know, all along. That is something Ukraine has already sent signs it's willing to compromise on. I think it is willing to announce it will be neutral uh, and, uh, you know, basically move away from, from NATO um, membership uh, uh, process. Uh, but once again, whether that will satisfy Vladimir Putin, I'm not sure, uh, because also connected with it are security guarantees that Ukraine needs to get in from Russia in return. In 19... Uh, in 1994, uh, Budapest as a memorandum was signed, uh, according to which Ukraine would, you know, turn over its nuclear weapons in exchange for security guarantees. Well, we're seeing now how much worth that paper was worth that it was written on, the Budapest memorandum. So what kind of security guarantees will Ukraine uh, receive uh, this time? Vladimir Putin wants to establish a new status quo, get more of Ukraine's territory. Ideally, he wants to cut Ukraine off from all access to the sea and then start negotiating. Well, uh, that's not a viable uh, construct for Ukraine. Uh, I, I do not think so. So, And Vladimir Putin, once, once, once again, keep in mind, whatever paper you sign, whatever agreement you reach, uh, the Russian side has shown that it cannot be trusted. Uh, Peter, you are a television host, and I'm wondering if you can talk about the meaning of what just happened in Moscow. You have the state TV employee, a longtime producer there, who stood up behind the presenter and held a no-war sign in English and Russian. She had issued also, had prepared in advance. Um, uh, her name is Marina of Sianakova, uh, um, a statement where she was wearing a necklace that is red and white and blue and blue and yellow for the Ukraine and Russian colors. Um, and she's disappeared. It's seems that she has been arrested. It is not clear. People have not been in touch with her. The significance of this protest, um, and also of the mass Russian anti-war protests, what does that mean to you as a Ukrainian? Well, it means quite a bit. You know, we are definitely worried about this uh, this lady, a journalist, our colleague. Uh, keep in mind, Russia has just passed this draconian law that uh, envisions 15 years in uh, prison term for just such uh, actions as you mentioned by this uh, by this reporter. 15 years in jail for uh, daring to criticize the government and its conduct uh, in Ukraine. Even calling it a war may land you in prison, simply because the, Rus the Russian side uh, refuses to call uh, to call it what it's uh, what it is, and the official term for it is special operation. I am doubtful as to uh, this having necessarily a domino effect. Even though since then we've heard one uh, very well-known anchor um, on another channel, 
uh, has stepped down since. Uh, but as far as leading to a domino effect you know, and, and also trying to overcome this informational blockade that Vladimir Putin has imposed on Russia, uh, that is doubtful. That is a one-off, I think, you know, and that actually led in Ukraine to, you know, suspicions about, you know, the motivation uh, of this and who the owner of the channel is and how maybe they are trying to position themselves to win an indulgence in the West, to be able to flee to the West, to not have sanctions placed against them, you know, to, to point to this lady and, and, and say, well, see, this is what we did. I mean, all kind of cynicism about this. I want to take this at its face value, and I would just say that what this lady did is really hard to understand for anyone who is not in Russia. Peter Zamayev, I want to thank you for being with us, director of the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. Finally, we have just have 10 seconds, but the significance of the prime ministers of Poland, Slovenia, um, uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, Czech Republic coming to meet with Zelensky in Ukraine's capital, where you are in Kiev? An incredible vote of confidence in the in uh, in, Uk in Kiev in Ukraine and the ability of Ukrainians to hold their capital to defend it a show of support we need as much of that as we can. Peter Zelmayev, thank you so much for being with us hosting a television program in Ukraine based just outside of Kiev. Coming up, Joshua Yaffa is with us of The New Yorker. He's just left Ukraine. His latest piece, What the Russian Invasion Has Done to Ukraine. He'll take us on his journey. Stay with us.